So we have about six classes left and we need to cover some aspect of uh, control. And we will start in this chapter eight talking about frequency control. And the first thing we need to, we're going to discuss here is what we call the droop control. And what is the meaning of that? But before that, um, we're going to describe general aspects of in, in some definition that we need to understand this uh, group control and frequency control. Uh, the first one has to do with the main goal of power system. We want to balance the demand in the system. You have loads, you have losses, and what you generate need to match that value. So in an ideal opera operating point, then you should have the same amount of generation uh, to provide the power for the load and losses. So in that case, we will be in an equilibrium point and the frequency in the system should be constant. Which frequency should we have? Ideally, the nominal frequency, 60 hertz in the country. So if there is some disturbance in the system, what kind of disturbance? Some, not a short circuit, Short circuit is a type of disturbance that do not create any power imbalance. When you clear a short circuit, the system go back to the same uh, power level. So there is no power imbalance. So these disturbance need to lead to a power imbalance. What kind of disturbance we're going to consider? Maybe a uh, load rejection, a uh, big factory get disconnected from the system then all of the sudden you will have more generation than demand. If you have more generation than demand, then the frequency will change. In that case, the frequency will increase. Um, another power imbalance will be uh, generator outage. So the power that generator was injected into the system all of the sudden is not available. Then you have less generation than demand. If that is the case, then uh, the frequency will start dropping. And when these changes in the power happen in the system, then we need to do something to stabilize everything again. So what we're going to do, adjust the generation from the generator. So in, that, in the case that we have less, uh, less generation than load demand, because one generator got disconnected from the system, the question is how we're going to increase the power from the remaining generators. Yeah? Uh, a simple rule may be, well, let's assume that all of them increase in the same fashion, in the same proportion. So if there is 100 megawatt and you have two generators remaining, you ask each one of them to increase 50 megawatt. What would be the problem with that? So here, David is describing two aspects. One, operational aspect. He's talking about areas. And also he's talking about a technical aspect. Maybe that generator doesn't have enough capacity. Maybe it cannot provide 50 megawatts. It can provide less. So there are two aspects to consider. In the technical part, not the operational aspect, but, but the limitation of, of, of the generator, we need to consider other types like for example, you have a nuclear generator. If we need all of the sudden to increase the power, assume that there is a generator outage disconnected immediately from the system. We need to increase the generation to balance against the load. How much time do we're going, we're going to use for this? Hopefully as soon as possible, a matter, a matter of seconds, maybe up to a minute, just to say something. Can you increase the power from a nuclear generator? Probably not that fast, not that fast. So here we have another technical restriction, how fast they can adjust the power generation. If you have a gas turbine, uh, 
a thermal unit based on, on a gas turbine. Can they provide fast response? Yes, they can. What about coal uh, power plants? Probably not. You know, to increase the power, we need to increase the heat in the boiler, produce more steam, and the steam will arrive to the, the turbine, and then finally, after some time, we'll increase some. But it's still, um, it might not be enough. Yes. The, the, inertia, the inertia will respond immediately, and we will see that when we are able to get some simulation. That's uh, rotating masses in the generator is one of the most uh, important characteristics of the power grid because they can provide very quick balance of the power with a cost, and the cost is the deviation of the speed. If you take more power from that kinetic energy, more deviation you will get from the speed. Uh, and that's what will lead to the problem of frequency regulation. So that will be immediate. Uh, but to reduce this frequency deviation, then we need to take action on the power output from the generators. So we will have to deal with what technology do we have. Um, so if, if you have just very slow uh, power plant that cannot respond quickly, then you do have a problem. So some small system in the world might, might, might have that situation. And uh, in my country, all times, we don't have that situation now, but the north part of the country was isolated from the rest of the country. And that system was mainly, uh, uh, the generation was mainly thermal power plant. Most of them, the majority in those times, was uh, coal power plant. So they needed fast response. and the way to do it, uh, when we have gas available, we th that system starts having a lot of gas turbine power plants that provide fast response. But before that, was was the only option we had was diesel units that operated with diesel. They work in the same fashion than a car, so you you start like you, uh, burning more gas. More, more, more diesel, and then you produce more power. Those are very fast, but unfortunately, those are the most expensive. So in this uh, issue of frequency regulation, we have to deal with that. What kind of technology do you have? How fast they can respond? And then you need to coordinate how you are going to actually increase the power in all the different technologies you have in the system. The, David was asking, uh, asking a question related to the inertial response. And, and the, oh my. It's, 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 it's like, uh, like five minutes. So we were talking about the need for balancing the, the, the power and, and the, the generated power and the demand. When we don't do, when we cannot do that, then we will have a blackout. Yeah. We, 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 we need to stop this uh, imbalance, and at some point, the generation and the load and the demand need to be equal. So that's the goal of frequency control. We want to have a perfect balance between generation and load. So David was talking about the inertial response. What is the inertial response? I try to explain that with this basic equation. In this equation, I have an, a balanced equation in terms of energy. So in a transient state, you will have a delta energy from your generation, and that needs to be equal. That's the energy, energy generated in a period of time. And that needs to be equal to the energy consumed by your demand and the losses you might have in the system and plus the changes in the stored kinetic energy. So we are looking at this from an energy point of view. So if for some reason here, uh, this delta energy in the generator is less than the delta energy from the demand. You have more demand than generation. Then to have a perfect balance here, 
the delta EK need to be negative. So basically, you are reducing the store energy, the kinetic store energy in the rotating mass. So to have a reduction in the kinetic energy, then the speed will decrease in the system. And that is the case when we have a generator outage. The frequency will decrease in all the machine because these machines are synchronous machine. In all the system, the frequency will decrease. The other case is if we have uh, delta energy in the generator that is larger than the L delta energy in the load. Uh, if that is the case, then to have a perfect balance here, then this delta EK needs to be positive. And that will mean that the kinetic energy stored in the rotating masses will increase, and that will lead to increase in the speed. This uh, response happens immediately. If there is a power in the imbalance in the system, this uh, will occur immediately. So why, why you are going to have these imbalances? We, we have disturbances, right? Uh, generator outage, load rejection, but also you are going to have natural changes in the load. So if the changes in the load, uh, you consider changes of the load during the day, you might have some variability because that's how we have the aggregated load in the system. All the people, all the uh, factories, commercial load, uh, are all consuming power at the same time. And we have variable consumption. We have different pattern of consumption. So the aggregated load might have, uh, if, if, we, if, I, if I can plot here the load in the middle of the night, Maybe it's very low, and in the morning it start picking up. Maybe we have some volume. Then in the afternoon, maybe it might increase a little bit, and you might have a load potter that look like this during the day. Um, but because this is the aggregated load, and a lot of consumption will lead to this aggregated load. Maybe you will have some variability here. It's not a perfect, very smooth curve but it's changing because the loads in the system are changing we might assume that these changes in the load right here might be something like plus minus five percent so with that plus minus five percent also the generator needs to adjust or power to keep up with that right um, but what about the penetration of renewable energy that might be another issue because if you have more penetration of wind energy, wind farm, for example, the wind might change importantly. Have you heard in the news what happened uh, in Texas uh, some years ago? I don't know. What did you hear? I heard two things opposite. Turbines were going to rise uh, because uh, by the Texas regulations, they didn't have to be. Uh, and so when there was a huge storm, they froze, and so they didn't have wind generation anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so that caused a massive plateau. Okay. And, and I have heard, that's a very good example. And I have heard all their situations too. Like what, David? Much demand and that uh, couldn't respond quick enough. Yeah. Um, and I also heard another reason we couldn't respond quick enough was natural gas pipelines. The natural gas pipelines froze. Yeah. So it couldn't be natural gas. There is a dependency of the elect electrical sector with other uh, systems like gas pipeline. And, yeah. Um, what about when we have too much wind? Can that happen too? We we can we can we can predict it, right? But but it's probably the prediction are not sometimes very accurate. If you have too much wind, I have heard many times in Texas, for example, just just using Texas as an example, uh, that the generation at a particular moment during the day was hundred percent produced by wind turbines. One case like that, and I have heard too also in the news that at that specific moment. 
the power from wind turbines went down to zero, and, and that's another issue. So you are going to experience more variability with if, if, if you rely on variable generation like wind turbines, and this problem of power balance can be an issue, can be an issue. What is the solution for this? Maybe there are multiple solutions. What, what do you think might be a good solution for this? We want to keep the balance all the time, at every moment. But if there are these things that are changing, what could be a solution? Well, a, a permanent solution would be energy storage. But we're talking about large volume of power we need uh, with large energy to just use it. And they need to be very fast. What else do we need to do, maybe? improve the prediction. In the old times, predictions were based just on a statistical pattern, you know, and, and they were not very accurate, but uh, recently we have estimation of this prediction of what could be the availability in, in wind, wind plants uh, or uh, solar plants that are based more on physical models. So these a pred a prediction model to predict how much you're going to have have improved over the, the years. Yes? So, Yes. Yeah, that, that's very, very good observation, David. So with the demand, that's another alternative that we have these days. And that involves people. Maybe it's hard to, to deal with that sometimes. And what is the, the reward they are going to receive? Uh, today, we have in the grid codes uh, in, in several systems in the world that there, there is a special agreement between power plants and big customers. So they can uh, start like cutting loads if needed and they get some benefit for special prices that they pay for electricity. So they have arrangement for that and they had been implementing this for, for a long time. But uh, probably the, 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 the question from, or, or the comment from David is, is directly, uh, directly directed in a different, uh, uh, direction in which we can use this in a more uh, proactive fashion. Uh, not, not to disconnect it permanently, maybe control the, the reduction of the power in a more, uh, uh, what, what is the word, not, not, not to cut a big shank, but maybe to control it in a more uh, accurate way, maybe. What, what might be a problem with, with that demand response? If there is, let's put the social aspect aside. What do you think might be a problem? Or not, not a problem, a challenge, if, if, if we can call it that way. Well, how, how many population we have in the country? More than 300 million uh, people, right? So certainly controlling the demand, not that we're going to control all the, all the loads, but some of them, it's going to be very hard because you have a lot of customers distributed in some area. So controlling so many customers in a distributed area can be challenging. So we will need some sort of architecture that can apply some distributed control and it should do it quick enough, you know? So that, that can be a challenge. Right, right. But there are there is a big area of research, you know, that our researchers around the world are looking into the, the, the problem of demand control. Most of the demand control that can be done in a in a fairly easy way would be for energy purpose, for price control. So they schedule the energy over a longer period of time, but it's not real-time control. So if we want to apply this for real-time control because we want to control the frequency, then that's more challenging. But I believe uh, the, the, the research effort are going into that direction. 
here you have a picture of an an unknown country for you, known for me, but for you, we, we will call it country X. And that is the frequency during a particular day. All that we know is the time right there. And look how much the frequency change. Uh, I don't have a very good vision, but I think that here we have 6, 6 a.m. maybe. Uh, and all the way here, we have 6 a.m., 10 minutes, something like that. So we have a window of time of 10 minutes. And that's how the frequency has changed. And these country use a nominal frequency of 50 hertz. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of changes. So the loads in the system is changing, and maybe the generation is also changing. And uh, it leads to that final frequency outcome. So uh, in red, that is not there yet, now it is there, we have another country, country Y. Unknown to you, known to me, we will not reveal the name, but uh, look at the line in red, red color, that line. That's the frequency of the, it, let, let's call it the frequency in some particular point of that system. As you can see, the frequency changes in that case are way much smaller. So the, the first system has large deviation, the black curve, but the other is smaller. Why do you think we have this different? And the explanation for this is exactly the equation that I showed you before, the energy balance equation. So in one case, um, we're going to have more deviation in the frequency. Why? Because this is involved with the kinetic energy. So if one system has smaller inertia for the same amount of imbalance, what will happen? For the same amount of imbalance, the same delta E K, the same amount, but if you have less inertia, then the speed will need to deviate more. But if you have more inertia in the system for the same imbalance, then the speed will deviate less. And that's what happened in that second system. You have a much robust system with more synchronous generator, more inertia in the system, and then you will uh, have less trouble controlling that frequency. So that's, a, that's an issue. We, over the last many years, 10, 20 years, we have been talking about in this area about uh, inertia and how dangerous that can be. Uh, if your system is highly based on power, a uh, synchronous generator, then increasing the inertia, uh, I'm sorry, increasing the generation through renewable energy can have an impact on that inertia. So if the system needs to increase a given amount of power, let's say a number, 500 megawatts, we need to increase the generation by that amount. You can use a conventional power plant with synchronous generator and with some cost, you need to make the investment, or you can do it with a wind farm, for example. The cost for wind farm these days is very competitive. So, so that can be very attractive, but the issue with that is that they do not provide the same inertia that an, a conventional power plant. So you will get the 500 megawatt in the system, but you will not receive the same increase in the inertia in the system. So potentially, if this keep growing in that direction, we keep putting new variable renewable generation, then the inertia in the system will keep dropping and dropping and dropping, and the frequency in the system might start deviating even more. Generators are pretty good for uh, controlling the reactive power, controlling the voltage. Uh, we briefly review in this course that we can control the field winding, the current the field winding. That will have to do with the induction of voltage, and that will have to do with the reactive power. What they can provide is a, a very significant, a lot of power. Um, 
wind turbines, uh, depending on, on the technology, of course, uh, can provide some reactive power as well. Uh, but that will require an increase in the investment, maybe, because then your power electronic device you're using, they need to provide also more capability, more current, so they can provide more reactive power support to the system. So, so that, that, that can be something we can consider uh, uh, when we compare these two technologies. There are different different grid codes in depending on the system, of course, but uh, at least the grid code will require, if you're connected with a solar plant, will require that you provide a range for the power factor at the point of interconnection. And you need to move around that uh, range. Uh, in the old times, this range was not very challenging, I guess. And they, operate within the range, but there was no other requirement, I think, that they can pro provide even more to provide voltage support to the system. Yeah. Um, I am not aware of any other uh, specific grid code that uh, require to provide a voltage control from solar panels in a more, uh, in a fashion similar to synchronous, uh, uh, generators, conventional power plants, um, but um, we, that's something that can be checked, of course. Yeah, we were talking about the need uh, of looking at this frequency issue and if the re variable renewable energy keep increasing in the system, we realize that this frequency control can be a problem. What would be the extreme of this? The extreme of this is what, what would happen if the system is 100% based on variable renewable generation? Would be, do you think we will have a problem with the frequency control or not? Probably, yeah. Um, we will always, the, the always the issue will be imbalanced. But, but the frequency that we observe here come from the synchronous generator and, the, and, 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 and in a inverter type of word, if everything comes from inverters, then I guess that you can set up the frequency. Can you do that from the converter? Do we need to use, keep using frequency uh, in the system and keeping the frequency at 60 Hertz? All this idea of 60 hertz come from the uh, conventional power plant, synchronous generator. The system is synchronized and everything works in that fashion. And we have built the grid that we have today based on synchronous generator. But pushing everything to the extreme where everything is a converter, would be this a uh, problem? Uh, what do you think? It would not be an issue at all. But yeah. still, we will have the, uh, to deal with the problem of uh, generation, right? We need to have the cap capacity to provide whatever power the customer and the losses are we have in the system. So the, the, still, the problem will be manifested maybe in a different fashion, but the, still the problem is there, how we balance the generation. If you have a, a system in which everything comes from generation that is a hundred percent based on inverters i guess that uh we need to redefine how we're going to uh, make the balance of generation and we will need to rely on energy storage somehow today when we have synchronous generator and conventional power plant the energy store is the energy storage is by default at the rotating masses of the generator, and that is a plus. And that's how we are operating the system today. 
And certainly we will not move from the situation that we are now to 100% of all inverter base generation because that will occur over time, right? At least, I would say, for the next 10 years, we will still have to deal with this situation as we move into an hypothetical scenario in which we don't need a synchronous generator anymore. Besides, there are technology today based on variable renewable energy that uh, can be still accommodated to use a conventional power plant. Have you, have you heard of any type of variable renewable energy that might use the same installation of conventional power plants? Nuclear? The nuclear power is, uh, is like a cold thermal power plant. The only difference is how you uh, produce uh, heat. One is nuclear reaction and the other is burning coal. Yeah. What else? We have solar concentrator. Today we have solar concentrator, yeah? So, so with those concentrators, you can heat up water, produce the steam and use, again, a conventional, of a conventional power plant to produce electricity. So that would be no different from, from a coal power plant or nuclear thermal power plant. I, I guess that has to do with the investment, with the cost. Well, how much you produce? Uh, what is the cost to produce uh, uh, kilowatt hours? You know, the, 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 the energy and the the solar panels. The price for that has been going down incredibly. And now you can see a utility scale uh, solar PV solar plants, yeah. which in the past was not possible because they were so expensive. It was not competitive. But the prices has been going down, and you can see those uh, type of plants now. So we don't know what will happen in 10 years. Maybe the technology will keep improving in different areas, and we might see other type of technology in the future. Uh, but my guess is that this will not change in 10 years, at least, maybe more. And if it changed radically, we might still have synchronous generator in the system. And it will be up to what is the percentage of the synchronous generator? Uh, because if the percentage is large, we still will have to deal with this issue of the frequency and the importance of inertia will still be relevant. It's hard to predict what will happen, but we will see. Why frequency is important today? There are technical reasons for this. How are we doing this time? There are technical reasons. And briefly, let's mention a few. Mechanical reason, which is not a problem now, but there was some um, issue with resonance. So if the frequency deviate too much from the nominal frequency, you might have mechanical resonance in a power plant. So that needs to be confined. If you operate in that area, you can create significant damage in a power plant. Another that might be more likely, maybe, is the excessive heating. And there is a relation, as you can see here. This is a very simple equation that we developed in 325 for a, an electrical coil. And this equation simply relates what is the RMS value for voltage, the frequency, and the flux, right? So if that, that's, that's happening in a coil, so if in that case, let's assume that voltage is fairly fixed, but you have changes in the frequency. What would happen to the flux? Well, let's, you have the flux here will be uh, proportional to the voltage RMS divided by the frequency. So if the frequency is reduced, what happened with the flux? Well, increase. And if the flux increase, what would happen? You might have more losses, heat. Your 
your components, transformer, machine, they will heat up and then you will have loss. So here you have some uh, uh, norm, you have a norm here, here's the number, that define what should be the typical range of operation for either a generator and a motor. So what you have here in the X axis is the frequency and Y axis is the voltage. And this is the different region of operation. Zone A, um, let me see. Well, we, we need to shake the norm to, to, to look at the details here. Zone A and B, I, I would assume that zone A is this, but we need to read what is the uh, meaning for, for zone A and zone, zone, R, zone B, which is out of zone A. But uh, certainly this is a safer operating region. If you're in that area, then you should be fine in terms of, of all the heating that you might have in this machine. But if you move out of that uh, area, this can be more dangerous and can lead to problems. What could be a problem if, if you have excessive heating in a machine, transformer, or generator? What? Before that, we have something very important, which is the insulation. You have insulation of your coils, and that insulation can be damaged. Then you might have a problem with your device. Another one, electrical load, and this is an old thing, very old thing. So power demand of electrical, uh, no, 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 electrical load. The, the power demand from electrical load uh, will change. It will be sensitive to frequency. They might not operate as we expected. So we want to keep the frequency around some range. But this is the old thing, the time correction. And to my surprise, that is something that we still apply in the operational system. So in the 30s, most of the probes we, we had at the time were electric probes that were synchronized through the grid. So if the grid was operating with very low frequency and all the clocks were running behind, maybe people were showing up late to, to work or to the university or to the classroom. <laughs> Then the operator need to speed up the machine and have an, a frequency higher than the nominal just to catch up with time, I guess. But the, the, the funny thing that uh, operators, they still use this. So after some time, the frequency most of the time is, has been below the nominal frequency. Intentionally, you will operate all the machine and try to operate at a frequency above the nominal. So over time, the error that you had in in, in, in time is minimized. Why do we need to do that? That's a big question I have. Uh, uh, here you have some other definition for, for, for the US and definition of what would happen if we have frequency in different ranges. This is a much larger range. Uh, if you operate this at 63, 64, you will have equipment damage, and that's what we were talking. You know, if the frequencies start deviating, you might have some uh, resonance, you might have some damage in the insulation. Something might happen that you want to prevent. Uh, there is a protection here, which is the over, over, over frequency generation trip, and then under frequency generator trip, and also you have the under frequency load chain. So we will define this uh, as a measure for protection. If the frequency is in 60 hertz and all of the sudden start deviating from here and you hit this mark, then you will start disconnecting load to restore the frequency and put it back into the safe area. The same thing you will do with the generation. If, if, the, generation, if the frequency keeps going down, you will have an under frequency generator trip and the same thing for over frequency. In the nominal, around the nominal frequency in this area, you can look uh, at a much smaller range for the frequency and you have other action that it will happen. So you will have a governor response. Do you know what is a governor, the term governor? 
have you have you heard that before? Okay, so so we talk that about that at the beginning of the the course. So that's going to be the typical range for when we're going to have a governor response. Typically, we will have a dead band. So if the frequency is within the dead band, we will have no action on the adjustment of the power generation. And uh, here you have the time correction, of course, that uh, is applied. The, the term governor is just to control the either the power or the frequency in the generator. So if you have a hydro generator, basically what you're going to do, you're going to take some measurement of frequency. And if the frequency is 60 hertz, you're not going to do anything. But if the frequency is going down, you need to increase the power from that generator. So you will take that, you will process with a controller and obtain an signal that will give the order to the bulb to open, to be more open, to produce, let more water go, go to the turbine and produce more power. So that's loop is basically the governor. The same will be, uh, the same action will be with a, a steam power plant. You will open the bulb to let more steam to go to the turbine and produce more power. Yes, as a governor. Uh, in all times, and, and there are pictures of that, for example, there, there is a, a mechanical regulation device that could do that. And that probably was called the governor, that uh, involves some bolts, rotating bolts, that depending on the speed, some mechanical part in that, in that governor moved up and down and was connected to the opening of the bulb. Yeah? Maybe the term come from that device. Uh, for, in general, for, for the, the, a longer time for the operation in the system, here we have a, a, a graph uh, over three hours. And then you will need to forecast what is the, the, the power and demand in the system. And then you, you need to anticipate what is going to be the generation you will have in your system. And then, as Ryan mentioned some time ago, uh, we need to deal with the problem of unit commitment. It will be cheaper to turn some generator off and, and to minimize the cost. So you will need to do this forecast and define which are the generators that will be connected at different uh, uh, period of time. And the plot here is for three hours. But oh, you have the forecast, but the actual load will change. And probably our forecast will not be that great and there will be some difference. So to deal with the, this issue, we need something very important. And that has to do with the reserve. We need to have a reserve, an amount of power that we can use if our forecast and the actual demand in the system do not match. And you have different type of uh, reserve. And uh, you will have primary reserve or secondary reserve, as you can see in this plot. Primary reserve, as you can see, is something that might be available very quickly, a matter of seconds or maybe minutes, and you can use it to increase the power. For example, if the frequency is going down here, you might use that primary reserve to increase the power to cope with this frequency deviation. And then at some point, the frequency will be stabilized. And then you're using your reserve for that. But then later, maybe in, in the scale of minutes, several minutes, 30 minutes, maybe more, then you have a secondary reserve. Maybe you need to store up some power plant that was off, was not committed with the unit commitment. Or maybe you, you will have other type of uh, devices that you need to prepare and you will need more time so they can finally produce that extra power. So they, they finally, they are, you have that in a power available and they start injecting the power into the system. The frequency will recover even more and finally can be restored and take it 
back to fifty. So we need to also look at this. What is the reserve you have in the system? And not all the reserves are the same. PJM, which is a regional transmission organization, PJM stands for Pennsylvania New Jersey Maryland Interconnection, defined the reserve in its website in this fashion. You have operating reserve, but the operating reserve can be considered as primary or supplemental uh, reserve. And as you can see here, primary reserve is something that can be available within 10 minutes from zero, uh, for, from seconds to 10 minutes. So in that uh, primary reserve, you might have what they call the synchronized reserve, which is online. So, and there is also a quick start power plant that you can quickly start and they can be online and useful to provide regulation in the system also within that time frame. Another name for synchronized reserve is called the spinning reserve because it has to do with the machine that are online and synchronized to the system. So if you have a generator and that generator has a capacity of 200 megawatts, let's say that, and you are producing actually now 140, then you have a margin here of 60 megawatts that is called the spinning reserve or synchronized reserve just for that machine. You need to consider all the available reserve you have at a particular moment. And this uh, issue with the synchronized uh, reserve can be scheduled in the unit commitment process. So when you decide which machine are going to be on and off, you decide that based also in the how much reserve you will have at a particular time. If the reserve you have is not significant, then you need to change your unit commitment solution and maybe you need to commit another generator that uh, will provide more operating reserve for this system. Okay, so we have a few minutes, one, two minutes, but let me start with this uh, description. Here we're going to talk about the main aspect of the control, frequency control. And that is called the droop characteristic. So we have the system, we have generators in the system, and we have here a plot of frequency and generated power. So at a particular operating point, we're going to assume that the frequency is nominal. It's one per unit, 60 hertz. And at that point, you have this power generated. How are we going to determine that power P0? So if you have 10 generators and all, all of them are synchronized and the frequency is one per unit, 60 hertz, how are we going to determine that power? Economic dispatch, most of the time, we will decide what is the, the cheapest option and we will assign what is the power that this generator will produce. So that's the point that we have there. But what we're going to do here, we're going to think now, what about if the system is not at that operating point because there is a disturbance? What about if at some point, maybe there is a load impact we put more load into the system. You have the same amount of generation, but you put more load into the system. What will happen in that situation with the frequency? You have more load than generation. The frequency will go down. Now, when the frequency goes down, what do we need to do to solve that problem? We need to use the spinning reserve or the synchronized reserve as PGA aim defined and we need to decide how the power will be increased from each of the generators that are connected to the system. How we're going to do it, we're going to do it, for example, let's say that that generator will, the frequency will go down to F1 and we need to define that the power from that generator will be P1, we're going to define a linear characteristic between those two that linear characteristic is the droop characteristic. And the slope of that characteristic is called 
the speed regulation concept. I like to find definition for terms that are don't use frequently. Um, it is helpful for me. I don't know how help, helpful will be for you, but um, before well, when I studied this problem, I, I didn't know what 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 is droop, what is droop. So I found I found the, the, the definition there. I put it for you, and the droop the, the droop definition is a verb is to bend on hung downward limply. Then I thought, what is limply? And there is a definition: not a stiff or firm. So what do you think that group is defining here? Basically, that linear characteristic with a negative slope. Yeah? It's hanging down. So that's the characteristic that we define in the group control. It's an inverse characteristic of frequency and power. And it's not a stiff. What would me imply a stiff in this linear characteristic? Or one vertical line, for example. Would that be stiff? Yeah. If the frequency goes down, how if you have a vertical line, how much of the power changes you will have? Zero. That would be stiff. So that's the definition of a droop characteristic. And what we're, we're past the time. But what we're going to do on Wednesday, we're going to keep describing this. And we're going to understand how by defining the droop characteristic for two generators can help us to determine how much power they are going to provide into the system. We have a goal here in mind. We're dealing with different technologies, machines that will not respond in the same fashion. You might have a coal power plant. You might have a gas turbine. Gas turbine will be much faster, right? So we need to keep those characteristics in mind when we define this. But we will talk on Wednesday how this group characteristic can help us to determine how much these generators need to increase their power to balance again the load. Okay? Thank you, guys.